you're here with us and you had to make that hard decision and hopefully uh, we'll make it worth your while. So um, I always say, uh, so native bees are my favorite thing to talk about and my friends are sick of hearing about it. So I'm always very happy to have an invitation to speak to an interested audience uh, and to chat with you about native bees. So. Um, so I've broken this talk up into four main sections, uh, and, and I do this general talk quite a lot. And uh, so early on, I'll try to gauge kind of your level of knowledge and like level of um, familiarity with our, with our native bees and try to kind of, um, you know, uh, tailor the talk from there uh, based on that. But generally, this is kind of what I'll, what I'll talk about. So first, we'll talk about the biodiversity of insects in general, because insects are super, super important to us as humans, um, and they're declining. They're not doing very well at all, generally speaking. So um, that's a really important topic that I always want uh, to take a moment to talk about. Then we'll talk about the diversity of wild bees. So in Alberta, we have 321 wild bee species on record. Uh, which is a lot. Uh, and so it's a really impressive number. It's really incredible. And researchers actually think that number is quite a bit higher. So, uh, so we have bees out there that we still need to uh, put on the record for Alberta. Then we're going to talk about wild bee life cycles. So most of our wild bees are solitary and they live in the ground. And for, for many people, that really kind of turns on its head what they think of when they think about bees and they're kind of picturing, you know, a honeybee hive, the colony, you know, hanging from a tree branch. And speaking of honeybees, uh, the very last thing that I'll cover is the difference between managed bees like honeybees and our wild bees. And that's a really important distinction. Um, and I have a feeling you guys are gonna be a well-informed group. So, we'll, um, so I, I'm sure you'll kind of have a, um, an inkling of, of some of the things that I'm about to address. Okay, so this is a pie chart of global animal biodiversity. And each one of these slices of the pie is um, made up with the number of species in each different animal group. So as you can see, the insects by far make up, uh, the, the, or there, there are way more insects and species than there are of other animals um, in the world. And when we talk about biodiversity, this, this is what we mean. But when we talk about conservation of biodiversity, our focus becomes much more narrow. And we start to focus in on just these few little pieces of the pie. And even then we have biases within those groups as well. Um, and that's really problematic because insects are incredibly important to us. They do all kinds of things for us for free. Um, and we will really start uh, noticing insect declines soon. So, so here are some of the things that insects do. So of course we all know that bees are pollinators and that's important because they pollinate crops in agricultural fields which are important for the food that we eat but also for farmers revenues. Uh, but bees also pollinate the native plants in our native ecosystems and our natural areas, which then in turn provide food and habitat for wildlife. So that's really important. Of course, there are a lot of other insect pollinators other than bees as well. Um, insects also provide nutrient cycling services to us. So uh, there's of course insects and microbes and all kinds of things going on there. Um, but insects do play a large role. And I've only recently been introduced to the fascinating world of dung beetles. John, if you need a speaker, you should have someone come talk to you about dung beetles because they are a fascinating group. But yeah, so in Alberta, you know, if we didn't have dung beetles and other insects, we'd be sitting under miles and miles of cow dung, literally, and lots of other organic matter as well. So they help to break down and decompose this organic matter, which is really important. They're also a food source for other animals. So even though individual insects are very, very tiny, uh, there are just so darn many of them that they uh, contribute a ton of biomass into our food webs and our trophic systems. So they are a really important food source for other animals. But they, I skipped over but this one. They also provide pest control. So there, of course, there are lots of insects that eat other insects, um, which maybe you know kind of balances out. And that's maybe not a, a, a net positive. Maybe that's a zero. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so they do all of these things for us, uh, which are really, really important. And they, it goes unnoticed, you know, um, but, but these are critical things that insects do for us for free. And researchers, this is a data study now, but in 2006, they tried to put a price tag on the value of these ecosystem services. And these researchers estimated that the value of ecosystem services in the US alone is $57 billion a year. So that number in today's dollars and globally would be much, much bigger. So insects are really, really important to us. Now, as a group of naturalists, you're probably very aware that our insects are declining and you've probably seen that anecdotally yourselves. Um, and researchers also have been saying for a long time, you know, they've been seeing anecdotal evidence that insects are declining. More recently, there's been strong empirical evidence to support this as well. So I've just got a couple of examples of a couple of studies that have come out in the last few years. 
So the first is a German researcher uh, that published in 2017. And he was a researcher in parks, like protected areas in Germany. And he found a 75% decline in insect biomass over 27 years. So 27 years, 75% decline in biomass. So that's like a proxy for abundance, right? And that is a huge number. That's terrifying, you know. Um, and 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 this is and this, it, he found these results in protected areas. So those should be, uh, you know, some of the best wildlife habitat, some of the best insect habitat um, there is. And then we're still seeing declines like that in these protected areas. Uh, researchers in 2019, uh, these uh, these folks did a review. So they looked at all of the papers that have been published on the topic, and they extrapolated. And this paper got a little bit of flack for being, you know, a little uh, alarmist, I think. But I, you know, I don't think they're wrong. And 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 they're suggesting that up to 40% of our insect species are at risk of extinction over the next few decades. So that up to 40% of them, that's a tremendous amount, and this is really problematic. So this is my public service announcement for insect conservation because bees are easy to love. <laughs> Many of these other insects are much more difficult to love and much less charismatic. So we, they need our help. Um, and, and I think what I ask of you to do to help address this issue is to talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, talk to your children, tell them that, you know, insects do all these important things for us and they're declining and they really need our help. Because as soon as we make this an issue kind of among the people, it'll be, uh, become an issue that starts getting actual research dollars for conservation. And right now that's not really happening uh, on any scale that we need it to happen. So insects are important, they're declining, and you can do something about it. <laughs> so with that, I'll, I'll move on to the B portion of the presentation. And so this is a quiz. So here's an opportunity to use the chat function. So if you might need to move your cursor around to find the chat. For me, if I go, if I move my cursor around and then click on more, a little menu comes down, you can see the chat box. So what I want you to do is tell me which of these insects are not bees. So they're all numbered. Hopefully you might have to move things around to see the numbers. Have a good look. And I want you to tell me which are not bees. And I'll give you a few seconds and I'll, 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 I'll monitor, John and I will monitor your answers coming into the chat there. Um, now these aren't crazy tropical bugs. These are not bugs, you know, bugs from the tropics. These are all insects that we have right here in Alberta. Okay, so here we go. So we've got some answers rolling in. So uh, they're asking if number 11 is a wasp, number one and number 10. There's someone suggesting Betty, hi Betty. Someone suggesting all of them might be bees. Someone else has four, seven, I lost this one, four, seven, five, where's five, five and 11, one, eight, 10, 11, okay. They're all bees. Okay, so we've got a lot of different questions, oh, answers coming in. Bees are two, three, and six. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to cut off the, the uh, I'm gonna stop looking at the answers. And a lot of you got the answer right. These are all bees. So these are all bees that we have literally right here in Alberta that you can literally find right in your backyard. So I know that there's like, I know a few people have seen this presentation before perhaps, uh, or, or maybe not, and, and, but, but I will mix this up from time to time, but tonight these are, are definitely all bees. And really quickly, I'll go through. So this is an uh, agapostamon. Uh, this is a, one of the sweat bees. And this is literally a bee we have in Alberta. And this thorax and head, this shiny metallic green, this looks like a Christmas ornament under a microscope, you guys. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, number two is a honeybee, of course. I'm sure we're kind of, we're familiar with honeybees. We kind of know that image. Number three is a bumblebee, probably another bee that we're familiar with as well. Number four is a nomada. This is a, a cuckoo bee. So this is a, 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 a nest parasite of other bees. Number five, also a cuckoo bee. Uh, this is a spicotes and a cuckoo bee of other uh, ground nesting bees as well. Six is an anthophora. This is a male digger bee. The males always look kind of weird. So that maybe that's not fair to throw the males in here, but they tend to have more white and yellow markings on their face. Some males have these big goofy eyes and they have longer antennae as well. Uh, number seven, this is a Celeoxis. This is a, another cuckoo bee of uh, leafcutter bees. 
Number eight is a blue orchard mason bee. I do agree with some people that this bee image kind of makes it look like a fly, but it's definitely blue orchard mason bee. <laughs> it's maybe not a fair photo to include. Uh, number nine, this is a leaf cutter bee. I believe this is a male. Uh, this is a, a little sweat bee. Um, and this is a hylaeus. So this is like the yellow face bees, um, if you've ever heard of that group of bees. Literally all of these bees can be found all over Alberta, which is really, really something. So let's talk about bees. Um, here we go. So in Alberta, I've mentioned this already, we have 321 native bee species on record. Now we get this number from the general status of species in Canada, something you're probably familiar with. So the federal government every five years comes out with a report and it lists all of our uh, wild species. And for, for many of them, it assigns a conservation status ranking. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so this is a really good resource, not just for bees, but for all kinds of things. Uh, in Alberta, we have 28 bumblebees on record. So look at those numbers. So we have over 300 bees, but only less than 30 are bumblebees. So that means less than 10% of our native bees are bumblebees. So more of them look like those crazy bees that we just looked at than they do kind of, you know, look like bumblebees, which is what we think of when we think of bees. Also on record are five non-native species, which includes the European honeybee. And we'll talk more about honeybees coming up as well. So here is the status. So how are our bees doing? Well, again, this is uh, from the general status of species in Canada. And, and again, this is a great resource. You can Google it right now. Uh, it has a report and it also has an Excel file with all of these species. And you can spend a lot of time playing around with that Excel file and learning and looking at things. So it's really, really cool stuff. So according to that report, about just over 50% of our native bees are either apparently secure or secure. So about just over 50%. About a quarter of them are unrankable, so there's not enough information for us to assign a conservation status ranking. Uh, we just don't know. We just don't have that information. And a little less than a quarter are either critically imperiled, imperiled, or vulnerable. So when you kind of step back and look at this, about half of our bees are either so data deficient, we don't know how they're doing, uh, or they're critically imperiled, imperiled, or vulnerable. So it's not great. Um, but certainly it, it's not fair to say that all bees are declining. Uh, that's not true either, but our bees, you know, about 50% of them, we either don't know or they're not doing super well. And that's a pretty uh, accurate assessment at this point. So why are they declining? Why are the bees that are declining declining? Well, a big one is habitat loss. Um, if you think of native, bee, what I think of when I think of great native bee habitat is a healthy, diverse native rangeland, a healthy, diverse, forest understory or, you know, mountain meadow, these native systems that provide the food and nesting resources that these bees evolved with and the diversity of those resources, which is really, really a critical piece. So we're losing, of course, our native systems, native grasslands, one of the most endangered ecosystems on the planet. Um, and, and, and that's great bee habitat. And with that comes bee losses as well. Of course, pesticide poisoning is an, is an impact, certainly pesticides by their nature designed uh, it's certainly insecticides anywhere designed to kill insects. Uh, they're not all created equal with their de the degree of harm that they pose on bees, and there are some that are certainly more harmful than others, uh, but pesticide poisonings are, are certainly uh, an area of concern. Pathogens. This is probably the second biggest issue. I should maybe re reorganize these, but pests, novel pathogens and pests uh, are a major issue, and this is the leading cause of decline of the bumblebees uh, in Alberta. So um, just like us with the coronavirus, right? Like we have no defenses against it. It's a novel disease. Um, and that's why it, we are being so hard hit by it. The same thing with our bees. So we've got to be very, very careful about moving around bees, uh, whether that's honeybees, whether that's buying cocoons and releasing them. These pests and pathogens can spread um, very easily and it's a major, major cause of bee decline. So we need to be very careful. And then of course, climate change kind of, we always talk about that when we talk about bee declines. We don't totally really understand exactly how this is gonna impact our bees, um, but we do anticipate that it may cause issues with synchronization for emergence of flowers and, and the bee emergent time as well. So, so those are some of the main threats that our bees are facing. Okay, so here's a bumblebee. It's probably not news to anybody, um, but bumblebees are big and they're loud and they're obvious. So we're all familiar with bumblebees, again, because they're big and they're loud and they're obvious. Um, and uh, bumblebees really fit the bill for what we think of when we think about native bees or when we think about bees in general. That's because they're social. So they have, they live in a colony. They have a queen bee 
they have a worker bee and there's male bees. Again, here's the big goofy male eyes. I don't know, and it, you see the queen and the worker, they don't have that big goofy eye. Um, anyway, so the queen and the worker, they're both female, of course. The main difference is that the queen is fed more food and better quality food while she's developing, which allows her to grow larger in size uh, and, and to have fully developed reproductive bits, which is super, super important because her main role is to grow, establish and grow a colony and lay eggs. Um, the worker bees uh, do all the work. So they go out, they collect all the food, they perform nest hygiene duties, they, they feed the developing bees, they'll fan the entrance to the nest on a hot summer day to cool it off. They do all the work. Um, and the male bees, well, I'm sure you all know this, but they have a very singular role, but important, and their role is to mate with the queens, and then they die. So a uh, very singular, but very important role of the male bees. So here's our typical kind of bumblebee life cycle. This is just from the internet. So here's a queen right now. It's the most exciting. It's like Christmas, you guys. The bumblebees are emerging. It's very, very exciting. So right now, uh, leading up to now, the only bees, bumblebees that we have in Alberta are, are hibernating queens. So that's it. So these queen bumblebees are, have found a place to hibernate last fall. In the spring, they emerge from their, their hibernation area, which is typically in the soil. They kind of dig down or burrow down into the soil uh, and they just kind of uh, hibernate for the winter. They rest and, and away they go. So they emerge um, right starting now and there's variability within species and between species as well. So we have early emerging species and later in the spring emerging species, but like by, you know, Canada Day weekend, all of our bumblebees have emerged sort of thing. Okay, so the, the first thing they do is they need to eat because they're hungry, as you can imagine. So they need early spring flowers are really, really important for queen bumblebees that are emerging from hibernation. They need that food so that they can go establish a nest. So in the wild, bumblebees will establish nests in old rodent holes, in uh, tree cavities, in the, a tussock of grass, like a big fescue bunch. They can like establish a nest down in that tussock. I always have bees nesting in my wood pile uh, under, you know, piles of, of branches. Any kind of cavity that they can get into that's protected from the elements and from predators, they'll be quite happy with. So the bee will, the queen will produce uh, this, what we call a honey pot, which she makes out of a waxy like substance. And she, she produces this and then she'll go forage for pollen and nectar, bring it back and store it in this honey pot. Then she creates nest cells and lays eggs in the nest cells. Um, and um, the eggs develop uh, from eggs to larvae. It's at the larval stage where she needs to be feeding them. Uh, the larvae is, is the, the developmental stage where they consume all the food, and then they de develop into a pupae and emerge as adults um, uh, some weeks later. So the, so the colony will grow in size, um, typically based on the amount of food that's available. So there's a few factors that will play into this, but food is a big one. So if there's lots of food and it's nearby, then the workers don't have to travel very far to go get the food and the queen doesn't have to travel very far to go get the food when she's first establishing the nest. So they can make lots of babies, right? Because you need to feed them. So, uh, so this, this colony will grow in size depending on a number of factors, including the amount of food that's available. Um, and as the summer progresses, uh, you'll have lots and lots of workers. The queen is staying behind just to lay eggs. Towards the end of the summer, so in like mid-July, um, uh, right on up until September, the queen will lay eggs that'll become new queens and she'll lay eggs that'll become new males. Um, so first you're like, how does she pick? We don't get to pick, how does this work? Well, um, all of the, the hymenopterans, which are the bees, wasps, and ants, so that's the order of insects that include those groups, they're what we call haploid diploid. So all the females are products of fertilized eggs and all the males are products of unfertilized eggs. So the queen has stored sperm and she actually chooses to fertilize worker bees and queen bee eggs as she's laying them. And she needs to know when to do that, right? Which is absolutely amazing that they're able to do this. So towards the end of the summer, she's laying eggs that'll become new queens. And those are gonna be fertilized eggs. And those queens are gonna get fed more food and better quality food so that they get to grow really big, have fully developed reproductive bits. She's gonna lay eggs that'll become males. And those are the unfertilized eggs. So once the queens and the males emerge, they leave the nest, they mate, um, and then everybody dies off. This is the saddest image in all of the internet. So the old queen that established a nest, she dies off, the workers die off, the males die off, and the only bees that go on over winter are the newly emerged, newly mated queen bees uh, that go find a place to hibernate, typically again in the soil. So that's your bumblebee life cycle, and that's kind of where, this is where like, we're like right here, right now. So, um, so that is your bumblebee life cycle. So this is what the inside of a bumblebee nest looks like. 
Um, and so this is a bumblebee queen. Uh, we've got all kinds of developing bees in these sealed nests. We've got worker bees kind of floating around in here. And you can see, so some of these old nest cells uh, are empty, but you can see some of them have a liquid in them. And that, folks, is bumblebee honey. And I wish I had something in here for scale, but you all know the size of a bumblebee, which kind of leads you to also suggest that there's not a lot of volume of honey in here. This is why we don't produce, you know, harvest bumblebee honey, because there's not very much of it. Um, so, yeah, so this is a bumblebee nest. This is a really cool thing to, to get an up close and personal opportunity to, to interact with it. We'll talk more about how you might be able to do that later on as well. So we're going to talk really quickly about two bumblebees, uh, two bumblebee species. So the first is the western bumblebee. Um, so this used to be the most common bumblebee in all of western Canada, like the most common bumblebee that you would find in western Canada. Over this course of about 30 years, it went from being the most common bee to being one of the most rare. So it's interesting. It's like not all the bumblebees are being impacted. It's just this one species. So what's happening to this species? Um, well, to explain what we think is happening, I'll have to give you a little bit more background. So we use bumblebees for greenhouse pollination. Bumblebees, as you may know, are really good at pollinating plants like tomatoes. So tomatoes hold the pollen really, really close. Bumblebees have learned that if they like wrap their leg around the stem of the plant, and vibrate their ring mu muscles and, and make a, it literally makes a buzzing sound, um, they can shake the pollen free by vibrating the plant. Um, so bumblebees are really, really great tomato um, pollinators and, and pollinators of some other plants as well. You'll hear them doing this on plants like wild rose on your tomatoes and, and some others as well. So if you're walking by a wild rose bush and you hear this crazy buzzing, that's what they're doing. It's really cool. Um, anyway, so we know that bumblebees are really good at pollinating um, tomatoes. So greenhouse growers uh, buy colonies of bees. And for a long time, we used the Western bumblebee. That was the bumblebee domesticated. That was the bumblebee people went and ordered and had shipped to them, and then they used them. Well, what we think happened was that a disease went through the managed population of the Western bumblebees that was being used for the greenhouse pollination. Then it spread to the wild bees because there was nothing preventing those bees leaving the greenhouses and intermixing and breeding and you know visiting on flowers with other bees. And we've found since that the, the western bumblebee and a couple of other bee species that are closely related to it are more susceptible to this disease. So we think that this is a big part of the decline. So folks this is a pretty big cautionary tale here is that we again need to be very careful about managing insects and moving them around and doing things. We have to be very careful about especially the introduction of new and novel diseases. Now this wasn't necessarily a novel disease but it has had very um, very big implications and consequences for this bee species. So yeah this is a really important um, uh, lesson that we learned here. So the next bee we're going to talk about is the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee. So this is not a regular bumblebee this is a cuckoo bumblebee and if you guys are bird people you totally know what a cuckoo bumblebee is right it's a nest parasite. So um, so the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee emerges a little bit later in the season, so after all the bumblebees have emerged, and instead of seeking out her own nest to establish, she seeks out existing bumblebee nests and fights the queen basically to the death. Now, as someone who has like a pinned a lot of bees, obviously, you know, as an entomologist, there's a lot of that happening, and putting a pin through the exoskeleton of this bee, you know right off the bat you have a cuckoo bee because they're built for fighting. Their exoskeletons are harder than regular bumblebees, so they're often successful when they invade um, bumblebee nests. So if they're successful in killing the queen, uh, they force the workers that are there to rear their, their young. So sounds very mean, um, but what I'll tell you next will hopefully make you feel a little bit better about things. <clears throat> so this is a regular bumblebee. So this is a non-cuckoo bumblebee. Now, uh, and you've probably seen this, but so, so bumblebees and honeybees have a special adaptation on their hind tibia, and it's a concave, like a, a smoothed, hairless concavity with then a fringe of hairs here. And, and you'll see bees like grooming themselves and packing pollen into their back tibia um, so that they can carry it back to feed their other, their, their sisters, right? Um, and so if you look at the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee, she doesn't have this. It's hard to tell, it's not a great image, but she doesn't have this special adaptation. She has a regular old hairy leg. She doesn't have the corpicular or like the smoothed out part and this corpicular fringe, which are these hair, hairs. So she's entirely reliant on usurping these existing bumblebee nests in order to rear her off spring which you know she's just trying to like fend for her young so it makes me always feel a little bit better about things so <clears throat> so this bee was never you know super abundant or super you know, super common in Alberta 
um, but it was here and it was all over the province. <clears throat> um, uh, but we, to, until recently, we didn't have a confirmed report of this bee in Alberta in almost 30 years. So this bee went from being, you know, not super common, but always here to, to being like gone locally extirpated potentially. Um, and, you know, what we think is happening is that this bee um, is prefers, has a preferred host species, which is the Western bumblebee, right? So again, this cautionary tale of not messing things all up by spreading diseases and doing these things, right? Not only is it impacted the Western bumblebee, but it's also impacted the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee. Um, and yeah, so, so again, this really cautionary tale about being careful and, and we need to tighten up some of the rules. Like still, the rules on movement within these bum movement of bumblebee colonies within Canada uh, are not really where they need to be. You know, there's some great recommendations and best practices, but like there's no legislation, there's no enforcement, there's none of these things. And you don't have to tell anybody that bees are important, right? So why are we not doing better? So anyway, I'll come back and rant a little bit more about that in a bit, but, but yeah, so this is the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about solitary bees. Um, and this is where things get really exciting, you know, um, and, and, and to be honest, I definitely am more uh, knowledgeable about, about bumblebees than solitary bees because this is a, just an endless world of learning. If you're a bird person, I think you could totally convert over into the bee world and start learning about all these different bees. So when we talk about solitary bees, we mean all bees that are not honeybees and that are not bumblebees. So it, it, when we talk about solitary bees too, it, they're not always necessarily solitary. So we should think of like the social solitary categories as more of a spectrum. So bumble or so honeybees are truly social because they live all of their lives with their with their family with their in their colony. Bumblebees even are what we call eusocial, right? They don't actually spend the winters like the queens hibernate alone typically. Uh, in the winter. So they're not always social. Then we have um, some of these solitary bees that truly act like a colony. Like they have a queen bee, uh, the queen uh, then produces offspring, also works with her sisters, etc. produces males, they work together to feed the colony, and so on. Uh, then we have other um, uh, bees that kind of will nest together, but there's no real hierarchy. Then we have other bees that nest in aggregations, but don't actually kind of uh, do any work together. And then we have truly solitary bees, which is the norm among these 300 or so different species that we have in Alberta. But there is all of this other, there's exceptions to all the rules, et cetera. So this is, this is like a generalization of a truly solitary uh, bee. So we'll start at the top. We've got an adult female solitary bee. She's foraging on a flower. Um, and she also has special hairs on her back legs where she carries her pollen, which you can see. So she's foraging on a flower. She's collecting pollen and a little bit of nectar. She's going to bring it back to this nest that she's excavated in the soil. Pardon me. And, and so she's going to leave behind this little pollen ball. Then she's going to lay this little egg on top. Now at this point, she's going to seal up that nest cell and typically not have anything else to do uh, with her offspring. Um, and then, and that's what we mean by solitary, right? Like she's not working with her sisters and she's, she doesn't have any interaction with her offspring. So she seals up the nest cell, the egg develops into a larvae, the larval stage again is the stage that consumes the food, uh, then the larvae develops into a pupae, and then typically the following year, uh, this bee will emerge as an adult to start the cycle all over again. So that's again the typical solitary uh, life, uh, life cycle. And most of these solitary bees are ground nesters, but some of them are what we call stem nesters, and we'll talk about those next. So here are the main groups of solitary bees. So I've kind of broken these down into families. There's five main uh, families of bees. So the ones that the apidae, which are the bumblebees and the honeybees. Um, and then we have these other ones. And I, I won't go into the Latin names, but so, so we've got our leaf cutter bee and our blue or mason bee in the top left. Those are stem nesters. Those are both in the Megachylidae family. Um, so those are the bees that you're going to find nesting, you know, in, in things like you can see on the screen here, but in, in a bee hotel tube or straw. Those are in, in the wild, they're going to nest, nest in hollow stems. Some of them, some of the leaf cutter bees and some of the bees in other families as well have mandibles that they can use to actually excavate, you know, rotten wood if it's soft enough as well. Some of them can use existing beetle galleries. So basically what they do, so you can see this leaf cutter bee, she's got special mandibles too for chomping out pieces of leaves, which you can see she's carrying, which is just really cool to see this. So she's going to go into that tube and she's going to create a little cell with those, that piece of leaf and other pieces of leaves. She'll lay the egg. Uh, and, and the leaf foot behind a pollen ball and seal up the cell. So she'll have one in the back here, and then she'll create another one, and then another one, and another one, and then she'll cap this end uh, with a leaf. So if you see some one of these, you have a bee hotel or something like that, you see green 
leaf pulp at the end, then you've got leaf cutter bees. Mason bees do the same thing, but they use mud, so they need to have access to like a clay soil to um, build their nest cells, but you'll see them coming and going as well. Next, we have the mining bees. These guys are pretty cool. And I had a question from Lauren about mining bees. Um, and um, uh, mining bees are some of the earliest emerging bees that we have in Alberta. And there is a mining bee that's already out right now. I had, I think someone from Edmonton uh, emailed this week and it's um, Andrina milwaukeeensis. So that's Andrina milwaukee. Milwaukeeensis, and it actually I don't know what species of bee I have on this image but it looks something like this it has this like really burnt red rusty colored thorax and then the abdomen is going to be quite smooth but it's going to be a ground nesting bee um, sometimes I think this bee might even nest in aggregation so you might see a bunch of them coming and going they're super super docile but there's lots of different kinds of mining bees they're ground nesters of course that's how they get their name they, they mine I guess tunnels in the ground for their nests and and you'll see some of them already as uh, they've already emerged I also should mention, you know, with all of these different kinds of bees, so bumblebees are active all season long, but with any of these kinds of bees, like most of them are only active, most of the different species are only active for three to six weeks out of the summer. So we have like an Andrina milwaukeeensis that's emerging right now, but it's only going to be active for three or four weeks. And then in that time, other bee species might emerge and so on. So at any given time in your backyard, even, you might have a different assemblage of, of bees. So like you can nature watch in your own backyard and you might see totally different bees in your yard in July than you're going to see in June, right? Like, so it's, it's really exciting stuff. So next we have the plaster bees. So these bees, um, they get their name because they sec secrete, um, uh, the substance that they use to like plaster the cell walls that they of their ground nests that they've excavated to waterproof them because you as you can imagine if you're developing bee um, that what water can be quite can be lethal right if you mold and that sort of thing so plaster bees there's only two different genera within this family in Alberta and they're not very even then there's not very many species and they're not super abundant but this is um, the, the one genera is um, the, the Calides, and then there's the Hylaeus, which again is those white or yellow face bees, which are just really, really cool stuff. And then we have the sweat bees, and these are the most fun, uh, the ones that I maybe get the most excited about, because uh, I have four images, you can tell there's four images of them on the screen. So sweat bees are incredibly diverse, they're incredibly abundant. Um, they come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. Um, they uh, get their common name because they tend to, to, to um, land on you and use their proboscis to lap up the salt from your sweat. So, so I can guarantee you that everybody here, everybody here tonight has had an interaction with a sweat bee, whether you know it or not. They'll come down, they'll land. Many of them are very like blackish, like kind of metallic -y looking. You just brush them off. You assume they're a fly or a mosquito or something, right? Now, and to give you an idea of the size of these things, and again, there's loads of variations. Some of these guys are as big as bumblebees, not quite, but up there. But some of them are this big. And I keep this so that I can show people how tiny they are. So here's my fingers for scale. And that's text so that's very hard to print. But like, look at how big this box is. Like, there's my hand for scale. Those are all bees, you guys. So when you're out in your yard and you're looking at things like the potentilla, you're looking at these, you know, flowers that don't even look like great bee flowers, you look and you say, oh, those are a bunch of flies or that. This, no, if it's on a flower, it's probably a bee. Could be a fly. There's surfids, there's other types of flies. Could be just resting there. But if it's actively foraging on a flower, it's likely a bee. Um, not always, but yeah. So start looking, and it's gonna you're gonna be amazed. And you might think these look like flying ants, and and at first they will, but then you you'll get an eye for it. So start looking, and you will find bees everywhere. Everywhere where there's flowers, you will find bees. It's just amazing. So very exciting stuff. So let's talk about the habitat requirements. So here are um, uh, some plants. These are native plants uh, to Alberta, and this this these species I've selected would provide you know a phenology of bloom times throughout the season. So if you planted these plants, you probably have something blooming at all times. You've got early season, you know, golden bean, three flowered avens, lithospermum, uh, then kind of mid seasony stuff like this penstemon and. I don't know if this is an aster or flebane, uh, and then this common harebell, and then you got later season stuff, um, ish like golden rods. Uh, uh, anyway, but you'd have a reasonable phenology. You'd also have um, flowers that come in all different shapes and colors and sizes, just like our bees, right? Because if you were a little tiny bee, you might have a hard time drinking the nectar from some of these, you know, long corolla plants. 
Also, we can divide our bees up. We, we do. We actually divide our bumblebees up based on their tongue length. So the most recent resource for bumblebee identification groups them based on their tongue length of all things. And so you've got long tongue bumblebees, medium length tongue bumblebees, and short tongue bumblebees. And even then, they can have uh, different abilities to, to collect certainly nectar from some of these flowers. Um, so you need different shapes and sizes of flowers to accommodate the different shapes and sizes of bees, right? Makes sense. The other thing I want to point out, I, I did put this campanula on here on purpose. So there's, we have a species of sweat bee. It's called, it's in the Duforia genus, Duforia mora. Um, it is a specialist on common harebell. So, um, so this, hair, this little sweat bee emerges and it only forages on common harebell. So what happens when we don't have common harebell? Because we're in a city, or we're, we've planted canola, or we've planted hay, or, you know, th then we lose the common harebell sweat bee, which is a problem, right? So, so in the bee world, too, we've got these super specialists that only forage on a single species. We've got, like, kind of fussy eaters that will only forage on a group of plants. And then we have generalists, which are like our bumblebees. They're pretty generalists. They do have some preferences, and it's kind of complicated, but for the most part, most bees are generalists, but we do have lots of specialists, and we have a fair amount of super specialists as well. So this is why native plants matter, because these are the flowers that the native bees evolved with, and, and we will lose our specialists if we lose our native plants. Um, and yeah, anyway, it's bad news. Um, we're working on a plant list. It's almost done, I'm very happy to say, and we'll have that on our website very soon. So look for that in the near future. The next thing that they need, they need food and they also need a place to, uh, to sleep, right? They need a place to nest. So as I mentioned, most of our bees are ground nesters. So, you know, surprisingly, some of the best things you can do is leave a little bit of bare ground for, for ground nesting bees. I think like 70% or, yeah, 70% of solitary bees are ground nesters. So a lot of them are, and they really do need this access to bare ground. So um, they prefer sandy soils that are gonna be well drained. Um, and if you can imagine, like, if you have, like, really healthy grass, they can't get through the fat to access the soil. If you have, um, like, landscaping fabric, they can't get through that. If you have big pieces of mulch, they can't get through that. So they need access to bare soil in order to, to create their nests. And, and the literature has consistently found in areas where there are patches of bare soil, the amount of bare soil is positively uh, associated with the, the number of solitary ground nesting bees, of course. So this is something that's often overlooked, is just you know leave a couple of patches of bare soil and you might be amazed at what you might start to find. Um, also rotting wood, <laughs> which is like, you don't have to pay for this stuff. You know, like you, the, sometimes the easiest solutions to some of these things are free or easy. Uh, you know, throw a rotting log in your garden. Don't even drill holes in it. Just let it decompose and nature will do itself. Um, you can see here, there's some existing kind of beetle galleries in here that beetles might be able to use. This bee, you can see this is not even that dead of wood. You can kind of tell by the color. This bee, I think this is a digger. I don't know, I'm not sure, but anyway excavating a tunnel, away you go. So um, so a little bit of bare ground, you don't need to like obviously leave your whole garden bare ground, but I'm thinking like patches, like small patches in your flower bed or something like that uh, can be really helpful. So we get lots and lots and lots and lots of questions about bee hotels. These things are so hot these days, my goodness. So you can buy them anywhere. People are willing to take your money for them too, let me tell you. So um, not all of them are good. So I will say we, um, we know a lot about rearing, um, no, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna talk about that later. Um, so be, not all of these bee hotels are great. Some of them are very poorly designed and will likely ha do more harm than good. Uh, but some of them are not. And what I would suggest to you if you're interested in building a bee hotel or buying one is just do a bit of research. And we've put together a best practice guide for bee hotels in Alberta um, that you can use as a reference. So we've kind of summarized all the information in the literature of which is very little on the use of these things for conservation, which I think is the reason why people are buying them, right? You know, obviously it's to help the bee diversity or bee population. So, um, so, so do your research. Um, and then uh, if you do want to get one, do your research and put them out there. I will say it's super cool. If you have bees nesting in these things, it's really, really awesome to watch them um, and really, really fun. Here's some highlights from the best practices. So one, keep your bee hotel small. If you have this massive structure, this massive bee hotel, it's like a neon sign saying, hey, predators, parasitoids, come and, come and get it. Um, and also, if you have lots and lots and lots of bees nesting in there, you could get diseases or something like that that could come in and wipe them right out. So keep them small, because in nature, their nesting, natural nesting resources are going to be kind of in small clusters, right? You're not going to see these huge monocultures. So 
keep them small. Tubes should be at least six inches deep and closed off on the back. So you close them off on the back because otherwise you all kinds of like parasitoid, parasitic bees and parasitic other insects and stuff that are gonna come in there and, and lay eggs inside the nest cells um, or, or do different things. Um, and you need to keep them six inches deep because there's certain species of solitary bees that will only produce males if the tube is six, is less than, or if it's less than six inches. So the, all of a sudden the sex ratio gets skewed towards males, which, you know, I'm, I don't have to tell you guys this, that's not gonna do anything for population growth if you wanna help the bees, right? If you have all males. So keep them six inches deep. The reason why we think they do that is because the males are more expendable. Um, so they're smaller in size and they, so they require a smaller nest cell and less food. So, and, and there's, there's also likely to be parasitoids and things like that coming in from the front. So they lay the males closer to the front, which is the entrance. So anyway, six inches deep, closed off on the back. And these tubes need to be between one and 10 millimeters in diameter. So I think even this one's a little bit big. Uh, that's probably not super useful to see that. But yeah, and that would accommodate the different um, bee species that we have um, uh, in Alberta that might nest in these types of things. You also want to either discard your tubes after use or clean them really well. Um, again, there's all kinds of things that can actually build up in these bee hotels. And again, this is when we start causing more harm than good. Uh, you don't want to be drilling holes in wood and then like leaving it, uh, especially if you drill tons of holes, right? Then you're breaking the keep it small rule and then discarding the tubes, right? So, so those are things you want to think about. So bee hotels, bee hotels are also complicated because there's different types of bees that will nest in these things. So you might get like mason bees and most of our mason bees are earlier in the season. So they're going to emerge, you know, in May or June. And then our leaf cutter bees might also nest in, the, in these. And there, many of the leaf cutter bees are later emerging species. So when would you take the tubes out and clean them? You know, it would depend on if you, what species you have. And, you know, maybe you have multiple species, it gets complicated. The one paper that we uh, are aware of that has looked into the use of these things for conservation has found that uh, wasps are more likely to use these than our bees. And non-native bees are more likely to use them than native bees. So maybe even calling it a bee hotel is not the, the, the greatest name in the world. Um, but I'm sure maybe some of you are interested in getting, you know, increasing your numbers of solitary wasps uh, in your yard. That's great for pest control. So there might be other uses for these things as well. Just something to be aware of. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about bumblebee boxes. Bumblebee boxes are super exciting. Um, we have, um, John, I think you need to remind me how much time I have. So it's 822 right now. Um, do you just want to unmute yourself and tell me when I need to stop? You're doing great. <laughs> just, just keep going? Yeah, so yeah, I think we have this till nine o'clock. So oh, good. Okay. you can uh, yatter on as best you can. I thought I was gonna talk, talk, start talking even faster so I can maybe even slow down a bit. So that's Dude, good. Take a breath, okay. take a breath. <laughs> great. Okay, so bumblebee boxes. Well, I can give you the full bumblebee box story then. So, you know, it's interesting for to us as Albertans. So there, there was, you know, early research in the States and a few other places like early 1900s on using these bumblebee domiciles uh, for research. And, and then uh, a little bit more recently in the 50s, 50, 60s, 70s, um, Gordon Hobbs and Ken Richards at uh, Lethbridge Research Center in, uh, for Egg Canada here in Lethbridge. Uh, we're using these and they were, you know, exploring the possibility of using bumblebees as crop pollinators and, you know, uh, you know, either getting them to nest in these things or, or collecting queens and putting them in them. And there's been a ton of research using these bumblebee boxes in Alberta and, and a lot of the work, uh, a lot of what we know about bumblebee nesting preferences comes from that view of, or the, the, the Hobbs and Richards research at Lethbridge, which is fantastic. Even more recently, um, Dr. Ralph Carter at the University of Calgary, now retired, uh, he's done a ton of research on, on these things, looking at bees um, in the Eastern slopes as well, looking at logged and unlogged areas. So we know lots about bumblebees and nesting preferences. So these things are easier to clean and maintain than bee hotels. So this is kind of why we promote these. They're really easy to build. Um, it's like a, it's like a birdhouse and I'm sure you all know about birdhouses with a smaller hole. So you're going to, so you'll exclude birds and other, um, things you don't want in there and, and hopefully get bumblebees. Um, so these things, we stuff them with, uh, this, this one, I've got a little chunk of it right here. Um, so this is just, um, it's a, smells delicious, raw cotton. Um, and the bees really like it. Um, and, um, and wasps tend to, uh, not like okay, the cat. Is here, sorry. Um, there we go. Uh, so um, yeah, so the bumblebees kind of really, really like having this, this um, substrate, this nesting material to butt bed down in. 
So here's a spent Bumblebee box with contents, which has decomposed. I should have frozen it or something, and it's all broken apart. So you can see this is the cotton. So we put that in there. But then the bumblebees um, build, can you see this? So yeah, so there's the cells. So the bees create these cells out of waxy like substances, and then the bees will emerge, like the, the, the worker bees and so on will emerge out of, out of these cells, which is really, really, really cool. So um, we do find colonization rates of about 25% in Alberta pretty consistently. Um, they don't like new boxes. So if you go build a beautiful, fresh, you know, sanded, lovely box, they won't, they don't like it. They're used to nesting in old mice holes. So they want a gross, stinky, uh, you know, kind of stinky old <laughs> bee box, right? So we find there's a bit of a burn period. So if you build a bee box, it's probably gonna take a few years before it gets colonized. Uh, so you leave this thing outside, let it weather, um, and, and away you go. So the only maintenance you need to do is in the fall, again, we went through the life cycle, right? Like none of these bees are living in here in the fall. It's only those queen bees that went on to hibernate in the soil. Um, no one's in here. You can remove all of the contents, discard them, and give the box a quick wipe with um, a mild bleach solution with also focusing on cleaning the front. This is where they poop. They poop out the front of the entrance hole. They don't poop inside their nest. And the, the, the bacteria, um, the disease I was telling you about with the Western bumblebee is a bacteria that spread through their poop. So you need to make sure you clean that really, really well. Again, we wanna make sure that we are not having more, uh, doing more harm than good. So, um, so the bumblebee boxes are super easy. We have a, a monitoring program where you can report back on activity in your bumblebee box every fall as well. Um, and it's super easy. There's a form on our website. So uh, there's instructions for building bumblebee boxes on there as well. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. So it's a really fun project. Okay. Okay, so this is your second quiz of the night. This one's way easier than the first one. Uh, so which of these two lawns is good bee habitat? So there is the one on the left here, and then there's the one on the right. So um, I'm sure you all already know that the good bee habitat is the one on the right. So the lawn on the left, this is a bee desert. There's nowhere for them to nest. There's nothing for them to eat. The ground nesting bees can't get through the thatch. There's nothing happening here. And the irony is that this lawn is very hard to maintain. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of effort and inputs that go into maintaining a lawn that looks like this. That's not to say that this lawn, you know, it would have taken a long time to get this garden in this shape, absolutely. But this is bee heaven. Um, and, and your efforts don't need to be this elaborate by any means, but what I'm showing you, this is like amazing. So look at what's happening here. So we have a little bit of bare ground in the front by this rock. Not the whole thing, just a little bit. And that's left there on purpose. Um, we have um, different colors and shapes and sizes of flowers throughout this yard. You can't tell from the image, but there are flowers that bloom here all season long. There's also plants that have hollow stems like delphiniums that are planted here, again, on purpose, um, that our stem nesting bees can use. And if you have a look at the very, very back, you can see that there's a bumblebee box on the tree back here. So this garden, this is Alexandria Farmers, Lexi Farmers Garden, if you know her, she's uh, an instructor at Mount Royal. She has a bee oasis in her backyard and she's amazing. So uh, this is absolutely wonderful stuff, you guys. But the, so, so the real takeaway here, um, is that one of these yards is diverse and complex and one of them isn't. And so, you know, nat in nature, like our native grasslands and our native forests and our mountain meadows, they are diverse, complex ecosystems. So, you know, they don't look like this necessarily, but they, they provide that diversity and the complexity that our native bees need. And we find that uh, in the literature that these diverse, complex systems support more and more bees and more species of bees as well even to the extent that you might think that like cities are like bad bee habitat because all their habitat's gone and you know who knows but cities are seem to provide just the right amount of diversity and complexity that we find that we have more bees and more species of bees in cities so much so that there's a spillover effect into surrounding agricultural areas how crazy is that so these cities are providing great habitat for bees. That's not to say we can't improve that and you know, grow more bee flowers and you know, create little patches of bare ground and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so the, the one thing I always tell people when they're trying to create bee habitat is focus on diver incorporating diversity and complexity into your system. And there's a million different ways you can do that, um, but that's kind of the take home message of, of that, um, that idea. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears. We're gonna talk about managed bees. So this, of course, this is a honeybee. So this is the other bee that probably comes to mind for us when we think about bees, right? This is one that we're pretty familiar with. So there are no honeybees that are native to North America. Uh, all of our honeybees were introduced. They have been were brought over hundreds of year, years ago with European settlers for honey and for wax production. 
More recently, they have become a really important part of our agricultural ecosystems. Um, so here's, this is a map of the annual American honeybee migration. So literally, all of the honeybees in the US are shipped to California every winter for almond pollination. Once they leave the almond pollination, they come back here to Louisiana and then they go off to, to the other areas for, to do the other crops, right? So let me ask you, what could possibly go wrong with taking all of the honeybees from all across the US, having them all mingle together in California and then shipping them back out? Well, you probably guess it. It's, it's the potential for disease transfer and it's very big and it's a very real issue that beekeepers are, are facing and dealing with now. So this practice of shipping honeybees on the back of flatbed trucks um, is not great for honeybees for lots of different reasons. There's a disease transfer issue. You know, you're shipping them on the back of these trucks across different time zones. They get here, they're only gonna feed off of a single crop species for you know, four to six weeks, which then is gonna result in some sort of malnutrition because they're gonna be missing some sort of nutrients. Um, and, and it's causing problems for sure. So, so here's an example of a disease that's impacting our honeybees. So these, these are developing honeybee pupae. These are varroa mites, these little brown blobs. And these varroa mites transmit diseases like this twisted wing disease that you're seeing in this adult bee here. And so this adult bee is not going to be very useful at all. And this is a really big problem. So these varroa mites are becoming increasingly resistant to the treatments that we have for them. Okay, I'm just going to put the cat down. Um, so yeah, so they're becoming increasingly resistant to these varroa mites, which is a really, really big problem. Honeybees are also faced with a whole bunch of other impacts as well. Like they, pesticides are a big problem for honeybees because they're always in agricultural areas. And we use a lot of pesticides in agricultural areas. Um, uh, diseases, pests, pathogen, bacteria, mites, there's all kinds of things that are impacting them. Fortunately, in Alberta, we have a thing called the Alberta Bee Act. Did you know that we have a piece of legislation devoted entirely to bees? So the Alberta Bee Act requires beekeepers to report back on the number of hives, the status of their hives, whether they're alive, well, you know, how are they doing, and where they are. So every fall or every spring, right around now, beekeepers are unwrapping their hives and they're having a look, how are they doing? They report back to the provincial beekeeper uh, and there's a report every year. We know exactly how our honeybees are doing every single year. So John and I were talking at the beginning and you know, he's heard reports that honeybees, we had a bad year this year and honeybees have died off. And don't get me wrong, that's a problem. And that's a problem for beekeepers bottom lines. That's a problem for crop pollination. That's a problem for honey production because Alberta is a massive honey producer uh, global, and for global exports, it's a big industry. So, so it is a problem, but get this, it's a management problem. And then when we look into the reasons why those honeybees have died or didn't, or didn't uh, make it through the winter, it's usually because they froze to death, they starved to death, or they had some disease that went untreated. So these are management issues, right? But it's often sold to you through the media as a conservation issue. Oh, the bees are dying, we have to save the bees, all of the honeybees died off this year, this is a big problem. So it is a problem, but it's not always the full story, right? But what about our native bees? We don't unwrap their hives in the spring. There's no legislation that protects them. The Alberta Bee Act just finds a bee as an individual of the species Apis mellifera, which is the European honeybee. So the Bee Act only deals with non-native bees, <laughs> which are honeybees. Um, these native bees, again, there's nobody monitor, there's nobody mandated with monitoring them. There is nobody, uh, you know, there's no legislation that protects them. There are a couple of species listed under the Federal Species at Risk Act, but that doesn't really provide effective protection because it's only, um, it's only applicable on federal land or where critical habitat has been delineated, which it hasn't been. So it's really, so the Federal Species at Risk Act is not really protecting species here so much. Um, and then under the Alberta Wildlife Act, there is a section for endangered invertebrates. And can you guess how many are on there? Zero. And that's not because our invertebrate species are doing well, as we talked about at the very beginning of this presentation, it's because they're not really tracking them anymore provincially. And that's a problem, right? Because that's a place where we could offer uh, actual protection and we don't. So what about our native bees? So they face all the same issues that honeybees do. Um, and there's no real, you know, we're not focusing enough on them. We're not monitoring them, we're not doing all these things. Um, and we're also worried about increasing impacts from managed bees on wild bees. And that comes in two forms. One is the spread of diseases. And again, the real issue here isn't, I mean, honeybees can spread diseases to wild bees, so that is a concern. But those bumblebees, those domesticated bumblebees are really kind of where we, we, we really are a big, big problem. So the spread of diseases. The other thing is competition for limited food resources. So we know that they, there's overlap in their, their food resources. We certainly know that. Um, and we know that at some point there's gonna be limited food. 
And so when does this matter? So there's been different research and different things that have been done. Uh, in 2016, uh, these researchers, they calculated the amount of food a honeybee colony needs uh, to, to get by in a single year. And that amount of food is equivalent to the amount of food that could sustain 100,000 native solitary bees. So one honeybee colony consumes the amount of food that can sustain 100,000 native solitary bees. So if we look at that in the provincial context, uh, we know from the Alberta Bee Act that we have over 300,000 honeybee hives in the, in the province. Um, when you multiply that by the amount of food that each one of them consumes, uh, which is 100, the amount of food that could sustain 100,000 native solitary bees, we have now removed from Alberta's ecosystems the amount of food that could sustain 30 billion native solitary bees. That's a big number. That is a massive, massive number. So this is not to say that honeybees kill 30 billion native bees a year. Uh, this is not to say that this even always matters. But the problem is we don't know when it matters. When is food competition an impact? There are no laws or regulations or rules or guidelines or anything like that for placement or density of honeybee hives for the consideration of native bees. That's a problem because this, this is going to matter at some point if it's, if it's not already happening, right? So this matters to us in Alberta because we have 41% of Canada's honeybee colonies. So we have more honeybees than anywhere else in Canada. That number has doubled since 1987, again, with no consideration of placement or density of hives for conservation of native bees. This matters to us in Alberta because you've seen this slide already. This is how our native bees are doing. They're not doing great. You know, about half of them are doing okay. And the other half, we either don't know or they're not doing great. So this is a problem. This is also a problem to us because everybody knows the difference between a chicken and a, and a mountain blue. Is this a mountain bluebird? I think it's a mountain bluebird. <laughs> Somebody knock. Um, so we know the difference between a chicken and a mountain bluebird, but not everybody knows the difference between a honeybee and a, and a wild bee. And folks, it's the same difference, you know, it's the same difference. So we are working to separate the discussion of, of honeybees and our wild bees because honeybees are livestock and they're a management concern and, and bumblebees and wild bees are wildlife and they are a conservation concern. And, and that's a very important point that we muddy all the time in the media and, and there's tons of bee organizations out there that muddy those waters as well. We're the only organization to our knowledge at the time when we were established in 2017 that focused solely on native bees for this reason and we strive very hard to make this, this distinction clear all the time. This matters because there's tons of misinformation everywhere and you know case in point you know there were a few things few issues with this campaign when it first came out. Uh, so Honey Nut Cheerios, well you can imagine that Buzz the Bee, well he's a honeybee right, um, and so um, helped bring back the bees. Um, so so you could have read every piece of information that the Cheerios people had on this uh, when they first came out with it. Anyway, I haven't looked at it recently. Um, you would never know that honeybees are a non-native livestock species, right? And, and this is being sold as a conservation issue. That's the problem. This is a Facebook post. Um, I, don't know, I won't tell you guys who it was, but it was a very reputable organization uh, right here in Alberta. And they say, happy world honeybee day. What do you think? What kind of bee is this, you guys? This is not a honeybee. This is a bumblebee, right? So, they're, so they've misidentified the bee. And that's okay. We're not all taxonomists. That's fine. So happy World Honeybee Day. But then they go on and ask if you have any cool wildlife photos like this one. So now they're equating honeybees with wildlife. And that's a problem, right? So, so we got in there. And we, we, we corrected them on that. But um, anyway, again, there's lots of misinformation there. Reputable environmental you know, education organizations are, are not getting this right, which is a problem. We also have researchers. And I don't know why, but we have researchers. This is one researcher in the US. He's got this great TED talk on why every city in the US needs healthy honeybees. And his argument is, who else is going to pollinate the plants in our cities? Well, we already talked about the fact that our cities are actually great bee habitat and we find more bees and more species of bees than we would think. And, and to, to so much so that they spill over into surrounding habitats, right? Well, they're not going to do great if we have urban beehives in every single yard, right? Uh, and then all of a sudden we're dealing with diseases from them and from competition. This is not something that needs to happen. This is something that can happen if you want honey production, but this is not something that needs to happen. Certainly no. Now, this is not a honeybee thing at all. This is just a silly thing. So this is the bees of the world. This is the bee Bible. This is an edition of the book that's now out of print, as you might imagine, because 
Again, this is not a bee on the cover. This is not even a wasp or anything else. This is a fly on the cover of the bees of the world. So, you know, again, we don't expect everyone to be taxonomists by any means, but you know, the publisher should have consulted with the authors on the photo that he chose. So there are, there are copies of this still floating around, but yeah. So there's just lots of, we just need to create awareness again, just trying to drive home that point. So we, I beat up a lot on honeybees in my talks. Obviously, um, they're easy. They're an easy target, maybe. I don't know. It shouldn't be so harsh. But, you know, quite frankly, there are major concerns with other managed bee species as well. So, um, again, we've talked about these managed bumblebees and greenhouses. Um, this is the common eastern bumblebee, which is the bee species that we're now domesticating for use in greenhouse pollination. Well, guess what? We are finding the common eastern bumblebee as a feral species in southern Alberta. And maybe that's not a problem. Like maybe it won't even do well, but maybe it becomes really invasive. I don't know. Remember when John told you I was the executive director of the Alberta Invasive Species Council? We have to be careful about introducing these things. The common eastern bumblebee is not native to Western Canada. And again, we, we don't need this bee in the wild here. And there's other issues associated with that as well. So this is a problem. We have not learned our lesson. Now, the other two species I'll talk about are the alfalfa leaf cutter bees. So um, alfalfa leaf cutter, so we have native leaf cutter bees, but the alfalfa leaf cutter bee is a non-native species that originated wherever alfalfa originated. It's really good at pollinating it. We've had this here for a long, long time and we use it for alfalfa pollination, right? And for other pollination of other crops. Those are the bees that you'll see in the tents in the crop fields. So uh, these alfalfa leaf cutter bees have been here for a long, long time. There has been very little research on the, you know, are they invasive? Are they displacing native leaf cutters? Like what's happening here? Um, there's also issues uh, now more recently with people buying bee cocoons to release. And so again, movement of bee cocoons within Canada, there's almost no regulations. There's very few rules. Again, we're really concerned about diseases. I actually did a search last summer for bee cocoons on Kijiji. And I found some people and I emailed them and I said, can you tell me what species of leafcutter bee this is? And do you test for, for diseases? So for commercial leafcutter bee production, they actually x-ray the a certain number of cocoons to look for things like chalk brood and other diseases that they might have and then and, um, carry on. So the producers are smart enough to know to check for those things, but backyard people are not necessarily, people are selling them on Kijiji. When I asked the person, if they were testing for diseases and what the Latin, the species name was, they said there's only one species of leaf cutter. And they said, no, they weren't testing for diseases. They didn't even know that that was a thing. So this is a problem. Again, um, we need to just beef up the rules on and tighten this up and make sure that we're not having more harm than good. And the other one is the Blue Orchard Mason Bee. You can also buy Blue Orchard Mason Bee cocoons to release them. Now this is a native species, but it's a non, it's typically a non-native subspecies. So if you're buying the species, it's typically from a producer um, on the lower mainland or like down in the, the Western uh, US um, and you're bringing them up here. So they're gonna mate with our native bees and you know, potentially bring in you know, crummy genes because the bees that live in Vancouver probably are well adapted to deal with Chinooks in Calgary. Um, and, or, you know, again, diseases. Certainly if you're buying from Canada, there are very few um, rules and regulations on the movement of these things. So it's all the rage these days to go buy these cocoons and people, call us all the time be like I bought my cocoons now what and I literally tell them to just throw them in the garbage like just get rid of them because you can definitely have more harm than good with these things so that's not to say these things are super cool it is really cool to watch these bees emerge it's really cool to get up close and personal with them but we really do need to tighten up some of these things uh, because we've already had some pretty big disasters with regard to disease spread etc with regard to our managed bees in Alberta so those are the managed bees. So to summarize, I guess, um, so, so here, I'm just summarizing the honeybee part with our native bees. Honeybees are one species. There are about a handful of honeybee species globally, but when we talk about honeybees for honey production, et cetera, we're typically talking about one. Uh, native bees, there are 321 species uh, on record in Alberta. Again, we think that number is probably higher. Uh, honeybees, there's 50,000 bees in a single colony. Again, that's why that competition for food is such a big deal. There's, uh, you know, on average about 50,000 bees in a colony. But most of our native bees are solitary or bumblebees live in nests of like 100 or so. Um, honeybees are non-native, native bees are native. Honeybees are livestock and native bees are wildlife. And that is really, you know, the take home message for sure. So now that I spent 20 minutes really kind of beating up on honeybees, I, we don't hate honeybees. Um, we still need them. They're not going anywhere. We need them for crop, we need them for crop pollination. And you know what, they're the only bees we're gonna get honey from. So we need those honeybees because who here likes honey? Everybody loves honey, right? 
So honeybees aren't going anywhere and we wouldn't even ask if they would, you know, it's not our goal, but we do need to tighten up these rules because we cannot have these industries coming at the cost of our native bees. That's, that's really what it comes down to. So we just need to do more work. We need more monitoring. We need more um, regulations and that sort of thing. So that's why we started the Alberta Native Bee Council. So we're a relatively new nonprofit organization. We were established in 2017. I can't even remember now, 2017. Uh, and at the time, like I say, like we're the only organization that I'm aware of in North America that focuses solely on native bees. Um, and, and that's a really important distinction. And so there's a lot of other things happening, like the bee city thing, like John was talking about. And not that it's a bad initiative, it's not. It's like promoting bee habitat, it's doing lots of good things but they're muddy the waters and they talk about all bees the same. So you can get beehives on your property or in your school or your city, allow urban beekeeping and become a bee city. So it's just kind of confusing, right? Anyway, I digress. So we started the Bee Council, it's very exciting. Uh, we are entirely a volunteer run organization. Uh, we struggle with resources and we, we, we try to do a lot of work, but we're always struggling. There's always too much work and too little, uh, too little time kind of thing. But um, we also have a website, uh, which is really crummy, uh, but we're working on that right now. You guys, I'm so excited about this new website. We have some young keen board members that are developing this. Betty Beswick, who is in the audience this evening, uh, is a bee expert herself, and she has helped us immensely with content. We are so grateful to her for her work on that, uh, and I'm really excited to kind of launch that website in the next few months, um, so stay tuned for that. Um, we've done a lot in the few years that we've been uh, around, so one of the things, one of the reasons why I started it was so that we could launch some monitoring, um, and so this was a monitoring project that we launched in 2018 with um, a ton of support from everybody. So we had an ACA grant, we worked with the University of Calgary, also the University of Edmonton, the Government of Alberta, both Environment of Parks and Agriculture and Forestry. So these yellow dots were sites and sample locations that were coordinated by us, the Alberta Native Bee Council, and the blue dots were sample locations that were coordinated by Alberta Environment and Parks. So the majority of these yellow dots that we coordinated were actually fire lookouts. So there's like 121 fire lookouts or something like that throughout the province. And we were able to get traps to them, the passive samplers that they set out. And it was voluntary. And they set out these traps. And this gave us the most robust spatial coverage of sampling for bees uh, in a single season ever in Alberta. So this is absolutely incredible. And then AEP went and did some complimentary monitoring to kind of fill, us, fill in some of the gaps, which was really, really great. So AEP, Alberta Environmental Parks is done. They have staff, so they're done pinning and identifying all of their bees. We're still working on it. Uh, we did, we have raised enough money to pay a contractor to identify the bees because it's about four months worth of full-time work, which we just can't do with volunteers. So, um, so we have a contractor doing that, which is super exciting. We can't wait to get the results back. The point of this is a uh, robust inventory of native bee species for Alberta. I keep mentioning that number, 321 native bees, but we think it's more. Well, we wanna find out if it's more. We want you know, a proper um, inventory of native bee species. We also want baseline data and repeatable studies. So we wanna repeat this at, you know, at, at intervals, like every 10 years or something like that to look at changes in relative abundance. Uh, we uh, can utilize data that we already have to create species range maps. Uh, we can look at habitat associations. There's so many things that we want to do. We're going to develop more identification guides. We currently have one guide to bumblebee queens of Southern Alberta. That will be great for you folks in Calgary. It's buried on our website somewhere. Let me know. I can send John the link if you're interested. Um, so with this though, data from this program has already been sent and utilized in the recovery strategy for the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee, which is listed as endangered under the Federal Species at Risk Act. So these data are immediately getting used, you know, and we're, we don't, I mean, we do want to, we'll publish basically the raw data set, but we're not here, like, you know, our goal is conservation. We want that data set out there. We want that going into the status assessments. We want that used for conservation. So we're really excited about this. Again, it's been a lot of work and so many people to thank, but a really big project, I'm really proud of this one. Then we have our bumblebee box program, which we are, we've kind of already talked about. Oh, I, I need to update this slide. But yeah, 2020 obviously wasn't a big year for us doing outreach because of everything going on in the world. But yeah, we've distributed, I think over, you know, 12 or 1300 bumblebee boxes uh, so far. We have two cheap wood cutter outers. And so that's a big number considering how much work is involved with that. But um, this is really fun way to engage people, uh, to get people excited about bees, learning about bees. Maybe they get bumblebees in their box. Uh, and then they get really excited. And then we learn more um, about these bumblebee nesting preferences throughout the province um, uh, with their reports in the fall. So this is a really great program and uh, we're really grateful to the Nature Conservancy of Canada 
who I know I'm delinquent on a report for. So if they're here next week, tell them I'm sorry, John, and I'll have that to them soon. And Mount Royal University, yes, we've had a lot of really great support. Then finally, the, the last project, this one is really near and dear to my heart. This one has been a very complicated project, but we are working on best practices for managed bees in Alberta. So we want to address honeybees, domesticated bumblebees, alfalfa leafcutter bees, and now releasing these mason bees through cocoons, right? So we need to address them all differently, but the idea is we know that these bees are here to stay, so we need to either avoid impacts from them, uh, minimize those impacts, or basically like replace or compensate. Uh, it's, anyway, so it's, it's a mitigation hierarchy approach, um, and we have a few things that have been published that have looked at this, but there's nothing, nothing great. Uh, so we're really trying to find some solutions that are going to work, again, uh, so that we can work with managed bee industries uh, to make sure our native bees are going to be okay. So this is a work in progress. Uh, it's a very complicated project, but we're very hopeful uh, to have something produced soon. So to summarize, what can you do? Simply understand the difference between those managed bees and our wild bees. Just know that they're different. Um, understand those managed bees can negatively impact wild bees, so just you know be aware of that. You can really easily create habitat for wild bees by incorporating diversity into your landscaping. So we talked about that, those two images of the yards, right? You know, your yard doesn't have to have flowers everywhere either, you know, you can start small and, and even if you live in a, a townhouse or a condo, I lived in a really crummy apartment in Sunnyside for, through grad school and we were on the third story and I had a balcony and uh, we had two bumblebee boxes. And every year I had bees in those bumblebee boxes, you know, and I had flowers out there for them too, a couple of pots and it was really incredible. So even in really small spaces, there's little things you can do and just, you know, increase diversity um, and uh, food and nesting habitats, which you want to focus on. And then finally, you can support the Alberta Native Bee Council. So we, of course, we're nonprofits, so we sell memberships. Our new website will eventually have a store and I have our new t-shirts on. Let me stand up a little bit so you can see our new t-shirts. This is our new logo, which is really exciting. And so it has uh, beautiful native plant silhouettes inside this bee, uh, which we're really excited about as well. Um, and so we hope to be able to sell merchandise, which we are prioritizing like ethically produced, um, good quality products that people can really use and, and like, um, and, and as well through those memberships um, as well. So all of your support goes to help native bee conservation in Alberta and, and to help those efforts. So with that, I will leave that there. Um, and I, we can open up the floor for questions. Wow. <laughs> lots of fabulous information there, Megan. And I know there's lots of questions that were keep popping up on the chat. Awesome. So I can keep you busy for a little bit. Sure. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Um, Megan, can you identify our little red bee that lives under our large rocks for about two months every spring? It has never stung anyone, but it's a little red bee. So I, I did reply private, so that, that came in before we started. I did reply privately to Lauren. So I think that is an Andrina milwaukeeensis. Uh, so that is a mining bee. That's like the earliest bee, uh, mining solitary bee that we emerges in Alberta. Um, and they are have a rusty, rusty, rusty red hairy thorax with a shiny black abdomen, super docile. Absolutely, Lauren, you're so lucky to have that bee. Now, what and what I want you to do is to Google that Latin name, which is Andrina milwaukeeensis, and, and look at images of it and tell me if you think that we're on the right track there. But that's what I guess that would be. Great. So a question from Carla. What can I do right now to feed or attract bees? I saw a very large one today and felt bad for it not having flowers to check out. So yeah, so we talked about this a little bit too, John and I, when we were first logged on. So, so those, there's are a few bumblebees that have emerged, and I guess I always kind of go look and at patches of native grassland. Like if you're in Calgary, you go to Nose Hill, where you know there's native plants. Are there native plants there? And if there, you know, so, so if there's crocuses, then there, then the bees kind of align well with um, the 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 emergence of those native plants. Um, you can get flowers at the greenhouse and put them out in the daytime. Uh, we don't really recommend feeding sugar water unless you have an injured bee or something like that. But even then, it's, you know, you can do that. But, but I wouldn't put sugar or water out for them. Uh, even if you could go get some pansies or something like that and put it on your deck, that might help. Pansies are not a great bee flower, but 
it's, I mean, the weather is so unpredictable right now, even if you're going to put things out in the daytime, there's, there's not a ton you can do, but in the, na in the wild, I guess my analogy with the crocus or my, my use of that explanation was there's not a lot in our native grasslands for them either. So those bees have just emerged too early and they're probably not going to make it. Um, but yeah, but so I don't have a great answer for you, but yeah, I guess some pansies or something. Stuff. Uh, Carl had another question about the mites. I think you answered that a little bit with the honeybees, but are mites a threat to our native bees? Yeah, so there's lots of different kinds of native mites. Um, I think the real threat to them is um, the novel diseases. So should something move over with like the managed eastern bumblebees that are being used for, for greenhouse pollination, or if mites start transferring from managed honeybees to, to wild bees that haven't, that are new to them, that would be a real issue. A lot of the mites that we have that are, you'll find on our bumblebees especially, are almost mutualistic. So they'll help do things. I don't, I'm not even sure I can remember what it is, but like they don't actually cause harm. Some of them can. Again, there's a ton of variability. Like there's some pretty big mites, there's some microscopic mites, and the mite world is uh, not my area of expertise, but um, but yeah. So so again, the concern with diseases and mites and things like that is the new novel ones. That's a real concern. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Ina had a question about bee boxes and uh, attracting the bees to her bee box that she has right now. So they don't have any occupants as of yet. Um. Yeah. So there's not a ton, you know. So you'll find them nest searching. I don't know if you ever watched a bumblebee nest search. Um, so, so here's a tip. So I told you when I lived in Sunnyside, I put bee boxes out on my balcony and every year I had bee activity in my bee boxes every single year. Um, and that's not to say the colony survived the whole summer because they most, most colonies don't. Um, uh, but so, so now the last, since 2014, I've lived in the crow's nest pass. I have a big backyard. I back on to like, you know, the crown land is amazing. Um, do you want to know how many bumblebee colonies I have had in my bee boxes since I moved here? Zero. So we think that the bees um, are more strapped for nesting resources in urban areas because we are see seeing higher colonization rates in urban areas than in more rural areas where there's more natural nesting resources, right? That kind of makes sense. And that though some of the research from the 50s and 60s has said to the researchers have suggested that as well. So I would just say if you build it, they will come. They're not looking for cues like colors or things like that that they're looking for when they're looking for food. Um, I would just put it out there and away you go. We, we are somewhat anecdotally at this point finding that the, through the bee box program that we are having higher colonization rates with bee boxes that are placed above the ground. So strapped to a tree or a fence post or something like that. Um, but I think that has to do with the location and that's because we have more people in areas that would have been naturally treed because there are different species and those species that evolved in naturally treed areas are more likely to find any nesting areas above ground. And some of our bumblebees have preferences and will only nest above ground, some will only nest on the ground and some will only nest underground uh, and some don't care. Uh, but Calgary would have naturally been um, grassland, I think. So uh, you should have bees that are probably more well adapted to nesting on the ground or below the ground. But that said, on the third floor back balcony, I always had bumblebees in it as well. So if you build it, they will come eventually. <laughs> Another uh, bad answer. Yeah, well, no, uh, question about a person getting bees in her bird boxes. Uh, mm -hmm. Carla said that she's had bees in a, in a bird box and wanted to know why they would go into a bird box. Well, it's a lot like a bee box, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so there again any cavity that they can get into where they're going to be protected from the elements and from predators they'll be happy with so a bird might come nest in there and boot them out which might be a problem but but it's you know it's very similar to the so very similar to the bee boxes so yeah Great. Um, that picture you showed of the bee hotel when you were talking about bee hotels a question came in is that picture of a good example of a bee box um, that's an okay example. Uh, this is the design. This is my prototype that we're potentially going to be endorsing. So, so these are just like one by four inch boards with router tunnels in them. You can see it's more than six inches deep. And here's what the tunnels look like. We'll have them strapped together. Now, maybe this is just too complicated, you know, because you do need a router and a router table. Um, but the nice thing about this is you can open these up scoop out the cocoons and, and clean this in the fall. And then 
leave the cocoons. You just put them in a box basically outside with a hole in it. That's the best practice that we could find in the liter the very little literature that existed basically on trying to get rid of diseases and stuff like that. So if you can get something that you can take apart and clean, um, that's what we would recommend because it's really about cleaning these things out and then putting them back out um, for, for other bees to nest in. So, yeah. Super. A uh, question from Lenora. Do you have a list of flowers and plants that best attract bees? Yeah, so that's what I have been was working on last weekend. So we have a uh, flower list, we've broken them up by natural region. So uh, kind, I mean, it's kind of loosey-goosey a little bit, like uh, anyway. Um, but yeah, we've got about 45 plant species, shrubs and forbs. Um, and uh, we're, we're also working really hard to categorize them by phenology. So when do they bloom? How much water do they need? How much um, sunlight do they need? Uh, how tall are they? That sort of thing. So this will be like a one-stop shop. The other thing I did, this is what I did last week, it was cross-reference with uh, three native plant suppliers, three of the main ones, to find out availability. Because I can tell you what the best bee plants are, but they're, they're not always ever available. So these are ones that we know that are at least sometimes available. So this will be a really good resource and we'll have that available soon. Yeah. Super. A uh, question from Linda, how much is known about whether native bees can use non-native plant species for food and habitat? We had a very heated board meeting about this uh, at our last board meeting and we realized that we probably need to survey the literature a little bit better because my understanding was always that, you know, so the generalist bees, like remember we talked that they have like this, spe this is specialist bees versus super generalist. So the generalists will forage on non-native plants for sure. So if that's a pollen and nectar source, they're on it. But the specialists are not going to be able to use them, right? They need the plants they evolved with. So that's a problem. Um, but the literature, I don't know, it seems to be kind of out. I always, always under the understanding that ultimately, you know, you're going to simplify, you're going to lose your special species, you're going to simplify, simplify your bee population. Um, but, you know, for the generalists, again, if it's a hollow stem, those stem nesters can use it and the generalists can certainly use the pollen and nectar resources. But what would always be best are the native plants that the bees evolved with is what I say. So. Perfect. I'm trying to do that in my backyard right now. So hopefully I might get a cuckoo bee, who knows? Yeah. Um, one question here. When you were showing the picture of the Western uh, bumblebee, you had a standardized drawing beside that. Yep. So the question is, is there a standardized way to represent bumblebees? Yes, uh, it is. Um, I will send this to you after John to send out. We do have that guide that I mentioned to bumblebee queens. Um, so actually this is, I have them here and I can, yeah. So bumblebee queens of Southern Alberta, I have this little identification thing. I don't think we'll have time to go through it tonight. But what I'll do is just really quickly show you how to use it. So you can see here it's broken up into your head, thorax, and abdomen. And this matches it up with a photo, right? So you can see that it's yellow, orange, yellow, black, black. It can be really important to see this with the image beside it to really understand how to use it. Um, and then you can match it up with the colors on the thorax here. And then also the yellow on the head. This head coloration can be really, really important. So any feature you see on here is really critical to identifying the bee because as you'll see in that guide to bumblebee queens, if you even Google it, bumblebee queens of Southern Alberta, you'll find the PDF. I have it right here. This is what it looks like. I did these diagrams in paint. So you see, you don't need all kinds of fancy resources, but these are the most common bumblebee queens that you'll find in Southern Alberta. That's a resource you can download off the internet and this is essentially how you can use it, yeah. Perfect. So I think that's all the questions I saw in the chat this point. So I'd like to, on behalf of Nature Calgary and all the attendees, we had up with 67 attendees, which is great, uh, to thank you for that great bit of knowledge and your excitement about bees. That was really, really good. And um, I know you have a website that you want to repeat for the uh, attendees so that they can zip over to the website and get all this good information, or at least maybe become a member of the Native Bee Council. And um, get a lot of that swag that you're trying to sell. Yeah, soon. It'll be available for sale soon. And it's Alberta Native Bee Council .ca. So it's <laughs> straight to the point. Yeah. Super. Thank you, Megan. Great. All Thank right. That, that brings us to the end of our presentation. Just again, I would like to remind everybody that uh, Earth Day is tomorrow. So get out there, look in your backyards. Maybe you got something buzzing around that you can uh, make a diagram for or something like that. And um, 
get excited about the spring arriving for us. Um, and also the last weekend of April, again, I remind you that is the uh, City of Calgary Nature Challenge over the last weekend of April. So look up on uh, Nature Calgary website for information. Maybe it's in the newsletter that we sent out, I'm, I'm hoping, or you can just Google City of Calgary Nature Challenge and uh, you'll find the information about that. So um, all the best and thanks a lot for attending.